Bon appetit to those of you who haven't uh, started your lunches yet. And, um, you know, we're here to talk on the panel Beyond the Public Core, uh, Protecting Software. Um, and let me just introduce the panelists. Well, first, uh, myself. I'm Lata Reddy. I'm a fellow at the ORF. I'm also the co-chair of the Global Commission on Stability in um, Cyberspace. And uh, the panelists are, uh, starting from the far right, uh, Zine Homburger. She's a doctoral researcher at the Hague Program on Cyber Norms in Leiden University. Uh, I've got Madhulika next to me. I'm going in the order I have it here. Associate Fellow and Program Coordinator also with the Observer Research Foundation. That's Kaya, Kaya uh, Siglik, am I pronouncing it right? Huh? Director of Cybersecurity uh, Policy and Strategy in Microsoft. And Francois Deleroux, uh, Researcher, Cyber Defense and International Law Institute for Strategic Studies uh, at the French Military School. Um, as I said, our session is entitled Beyond the Public Core Protecting Software. And uh, we've been asked, we've been given some general questions to guide the discussions on this panel. And the first question is, have conceptions of the public core suffered from being too technical? Is it time to acknowledge the human and commercial elements that make up this core? Second question, who underwrites the protection of the public core? And how can institutional arrangements respond to the differential needs and capabilities of states in cyberspace? Third question, how can the security of mass market products servicing the public core of the internet be made accommodative of the realities in developing countries? Um, before I turn it over to the uh, panel to make a brief presentation, I just want to also mention the work that the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace has done on this particular issue. We issued a call, uh, a call for uh, protecting the public core of the internet. In fact, that was issued in Delhi in November uh, 2017 on the sidelines of the uh, GCCS, uh, the Global, Global Conference on Cybersecurity or the London Process as it's sometimes uh, referred to. And uh, what we said was, the, we actually framed a proposed norm. Now, obviously, we are not an official group. We don't have official standing uh, in terms of being a, rep a UN body or uh, with representatives of governments. But what we are trying to do is to find solutions. And what we suggested about the public core was that without prejudice to their rights and obligations, states and non-state actors should not conduct or knowingly allow activity that intentionally and substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet and therefore the stability of cyberspace. And we then went on to define later in Bratislava in May this year, uh, what we meant by the definition of the public core to which this norm would apply. And essentially, we talked about packet routing and forwarding. We talked about naming and numbering systems. We talked about the cryptographic mechanisms of security and identity. And we talked about physical transmission media. Uh, but I think this brings me back to the driving question which was put to our panel which is, has it been overly technical, this definition of the public core? We were very clear in the commission that what we were talking about was the physical infrastructure, the technical technology infrastructure, which enables the internet to function. We were not getting into content. We were not getting into fake news. We were not getting into these kind of issues when we talked about the public core. But I think the question that's being put is, do we need to be not be purely technical? Do we need to go beyond that, look at human costs, 
look at commercial uh, elements that make up the public core. So I think I'll now turn it over to the panel. Uh, Zine, may I start with you? What would you like to say on this? Yeah, thank you very much um, mm. for this um, interesting introduction. And I would like to first maybe, um, before going more into detail, also zoom out a little bit. I'm a researcher and one of the focus points is the whole debate on international norms um, on state behavior in cyberspace. So um, yeah, this expansion now from the public core norm towards not only a physical layer, but also the logical layer is, is super important, as it was mentioned, but it's also in terms of um, agreement on an international level, of course, can be seen quite critical, because are we gonna expand then the norm, what we mean with it, or are we just gonna say we need several norms to implement actually this um, public core norm, because we have seen that through, for example, the use of IoT devices and vulnerabilities in there, um, that can be used for creating a bot then in the dying incident that this can definitely affect these core functionalities um, of the internet. So um, as regard to the first, already in the narrow wording of the public core, um, I mean the Netherlands tried to push this in also in the UNGGE forum, but it didn't get accepted as a public core norm. Of course, the 11 norms in the 2015 report mirror a lot of the ideas of the public core, um, but not as a public core norm. So now extending it, it's questionable how far we can get, at least for states to agree on it. Um, maybe it's then more a way to acknowledge also the commercial side of it and um, get especially the private sector to stand behind it and push for it. And the other thing I would like to pick up is that if we, the thing what was mentioned about different capabilities of states and um, how especially economically developing countries can pick it up, I think that's a really important point, especially with regard to the whole norms debate, right? That we are talking about norms, we are talking about what we want, need to protect, how we need to protect it but then a majority of states might just not have the capacities to actually follow these norms and implement it. So, and that means like starting with awareness of the issues we are talking about, but then also structural organizations having um, roles assigned within a government or uh, together with um, in public private partnerships um, to make decisions to disclose, for example, vulnerabilities um, and advice for patching them. Um, so yeah, that, that is just like a little bit zooming out and I hope now it gets more to the <laughs> concrete, uh, commercial especially, and uh, human part of it. Uh, thank you, Zini. Uh, could I have the industry take from Kaya? Um, sure. Um, so I would. Uh, so first of all, I would say thank you for having me here. Uh, I think this is my probably third OREF, and it's always exciting to be here. There's always lots of interesting discussions, and I think this is one of them. I think I would. I would really agree with you in terms of um, the you know the points you made about how um, it's important that you actually reach agreement across different countries on norms that are there, and and we are at the stage where the protection of the public core of the internet has not really been an acknowledged norm uh, by states, right? The Global Commission has put it forward, the Dutch have put it forward, um, Microsoft as an entity is very supportive of those efforts, but we need to now also move to the point where um, other parts, whether it's governments, whether it's other, pr other private actor sectors, uh, private actors rather, um, actually st stand up and sort of endorse it in some way, whether it's um, informally, whether it's through some sort of an agreement, maybe the new UNGGE, maybe it's just an adoption of principles, sort of as we've seen in sort of the G7, G20 context over the past few years, and then sort of also moved from there to start implementing it. And uh, the, the, the question about whether the language is too technical, I think, um, I took it in a slightly different way um, than sort of Lara positioned it. I think the, the ch 
and I think built on your point, the challenge often is that the communities in this space, so the diplomatic circles who agree the norms, the lawyers who agree the norms, and the recipients in the countries, as well as the technical actors in the private sector, don't speak the same language. So the question is, and, and we had this recent discussion um, with sort of a set of diplomats of sort of what is an attack, and it's clear that in the industry, a cyber attack is a very defined sort of intrusion into a system. To a diplomatic circle, that has a completely different connotation that sort of bridges inter sort of international law, uh, law of war, and, it, and you, you, we spend probably two hours to get to the point we were like, no, no, this is what we mean, <laughs> right? So, and, and, and that's where I think the question of language is so important here. You need to use uh, terms that sort of uh, go across those three communities so you can implement them. You need to use real life examples so people know what you actually trying to protect and what effects a potential attack could have. Um, and, and I think that's where it's sort of, when you just talk about the you know, specific crypto algorithms or you speak about just naming product protocols, that gets really hard sometimes for all the communities to understand what you're actually trying to protect. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Francois? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the organizer for having me um, today. Um, I would like actually to reflect on um, Kara points uh, on this question of the language. And I think it's also something very important that, yes, the language may be focusing on the technique, but it's also a bit technical and maybe difficult to understand, like for non uh, people who are not working in this area or not focusing on this area. And I think in that sense, it will be very interesting actually to bring back in the norm or in another norm, the human aspect and the commercial aspect. Because this will be the only way we can raise awareness among the population or among the non-tech specialists, people or even policy makers, mm -hmm. and to make them understand what is the point of this kind of norms. Mm -hmm. Yet, I think at the same time, and this is what you are saying, that we need to have this technical language and this technical discussion, both on the technical part, but also from a legal point of view, to be able actually to address what are the problems, what, are, what we want actually to avoid. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way we will be able to have implementation of the norm. Because if you, are, if you remain too vague, it will be always very easy to circumvent what you try uh, to avoid. Um, that being said, I wanted also to raise uh, another point. Like, from the, the topic of this, uh, of this panel, this idea of going from the public core protection towards uh, software protection, and say to protect software, mm -hmm. I think it's also very interesting to look at what has been conducted so far in this uh, perspective, and mainly the Vasna agreement, which is this non-binding agreement between 40 states where they are discussing how to regulate and to limit the proliferation of dual use uh, object, including cyber object. And I think here it's very important for this discussion because one of the question could be whether or not we need to expand this question of limiting intrusion software to be proliferate, uh, focusing on the, like maybe the, we need a subcategory of intrusion software targeting operating system or this mass market um, software, having this very specific protection. And in the same way, having a specific protection maybe on the logic chain uh, linked to this, um, to this software or this operating system. And this was already something not specific to this uh, mass market uh, software, but something discussed at the UNGG, also something that you put in the norms you proposed um, three years ago, I would say. Uh, so I think, yeah, this would be a point that could be interested to link to the norm on the, on the public core. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to uh, address perhaps the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, some of the points which we haven't really been addressed in full. Uh, one is how do you think institutional arrangements uh, can respond to the differential needs and capabilities of states uh, in cyberspace? And the second would be how can the security of mass ma market products be made accommodative of the realities in developing countries? If you could 
in addition to your opening remarks, also look at the specific uh, issue. Um, thank you so much, uh, Lata. So just to begin with, um, it's probably not befitting for the last speaker on a panel to on, about norms to wax eloquent about why norms are important, but I'm going to try and do it anyway. Um, something we have seen right now at SciFi as well, we had a discussion on how data divides the world yesterday. We're having one tomorrow, I think, on whose data is it anyway. Uh, we are seeing this resurgent um, nationalism um, being reflected um, in the digital domain. Um, so we can see that especially with the Indian government uh, trying to co-opt possibly um, an Indian narrative for how the internet can be best leveraged. Um, so essentially, um, states are trying to view the internet not as just a common medium or a Western export, but how best to uh, create national uh, narratives that can further state interests. Um, I only bring this up because norms poss possibly represent this one single um, domain or point of cooperation for all states. So even as we all disagree about how uh, we want our internet to look, uh, when it comes to norms at least, states will have to come to the same table to have a productive discussion. Um, so to that extent, I think since this conversation is about going beyond um, uh, public code, um, the technical archite uh, architecture of the internet um, while it's important and it's a low key, uh, it's, a, it's a common denominator that all states can agree to. Uh, what we're seeing now is that states are probably more interested in leveraging what's on top of the internet. Um, so essentially, uh, the conversation right now is about information warfare or how do you use the internet, not necessarily to um, um, create attacks which have a kinetic effect, but how best to use it as a subversive tool to manipulate um, other states and non-state actors. Um, so to that extent, I think while this is an easy, uh, what would seem like an easy norm that all states should be able to agree to, um, this may not be, let's say, as urgent as a norm on um, information warfare, for example. And it is possible to argue that the um, 11 norms that we agree to at UNGG necessarily also um, address public core as well, um, as long as you have a norm to protect um, critical information infrastructure as well. So given this political reality and the economic reality that um, companies are increasingly reliant um, on the internet, um, we are seeing norms being firmly brought back to the table. Uh, so specifically, there are three developments just over the last month that we can see. Um, something that Stuart mentioned uh, yesterday was about ASEAN agreeing to the, uh, I mean, endorsing the 11 principles that UNGG came out with. Uh, we can see that the US has proposed that we have something similar um, to the UNGG being reconstituted. Uh, we also heard from them about having an uh, international cyber deterrence initiative where like-minded states come together. Um, but the third bit and the trend I think that could be relevant going on is this idea of um, active cyber defense um, that we've been hearing about for a while now, which is um, known as hackbacks, um, essentially. But this idea that private actors are not just the uh, first line of defense, but the last line of defense as well. Um, so not only are these attacks perpetrated on, let's say, network operators in this case, um, but they also find themselves in a position to be, be able to better handle or respond to attacks. Um, so I think to that extent, we can think of ways uh, in which the private sector can collaborate or work closely with the state. So I think the act that was um, proposed in the US calls for um, the private company and the FBI or the NSA working closely together um, to find a way to respond to cyber attacks. Um, so I think um, I mean, moving forward, we might want to think about ways in which we can, I mean, for a lack of a better term, legitimize something like hackbacks? Is there a way uh, for government to closely work or law enforcement to closely work uh, with the private sector? I can see Angela is uh, going to disagree already. But the point essentially being how best can the private sector and the state work together? Um, and that's something that we can talk about as well if we want to humanize um, uh, the internet and not restrict it to just the technical architecture. Um, I'm not sure I answered either of the two questions that you posed, but I tried. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that was interesting. You raised a lot of important issues, and I'm pretty sure we'll have a lot of feedback from the audience on this, as well as within the panel. But Kaya, maybe I could move to you. Uh, what, do you what do you think about who underwrites the public core of the internet? Um, so I think two things. I think uh, to, to your question, and then I will sort of talk a little bit about, about some of the things that Madhuka said as well. I think it, it the the challenges in um, you know the, the all challenges that we have I think in the internet come from the fact that it wasn't designed to be what it is now from the start right and I think it is a combination of different players 
that have to work together, that have different responsibilities, whether it's the whether it's the private sector, whether it's the standard setting organizations, whether it's the governments, whether it's the civil society, they, they need to balance their differing and sometimes competing, but sometimes um, interests that align, um, both from a national perspective, from a business perspective, from just their, what is their raison d'etre perspective. And, and so the, it's, it's effectively the, a question, the broader question of internet governance. And I think um, that's sort of, that's why it's hard to answer that question, right? Mm. Who, who underwrites it, it kind of depends a little bit on where you sit. Right, and whether what kind of what kind of role do you play in this space? Whether you are a uh, business provider of a of a particular service that supports the the public core, then it's obviously your responsibility to protect. But if you are uh, protect that, that that particular piece, not everything. If there is, if if the public the a particular a sort of medical uh, sort of alluded to, if it sits in your country. Um, and it's part of the critical infrastructure, y as a government, it's your responsibility to make sure that you put uh, regulations in place to ensure that it's protected from your side as well. Mm. Right? So, so it's, it's really, really dependent. I think to Marika's point on, on sort of the broadening out the discussion, I think what both Zina and I said is sort of the challenge is that you know, even the, the basic uh, even though I really agree that I think it seems to be in the country's self-interest not to bring the internet down, um, it, it's, it, it was the, the, the Dutch, when they put the proposal forward, they couldn't get enough agreement even on the basic limits of sort of, ha let's, let's agree not to bring the internet down, right, as a whole. So when you move into the information operations space, I think the, the, the likelihood of, even though it seems and it is a very pressing problem, the likelihood of, of getting governments to agree to not act it, is, I think, lo like far, far away. Mm -hmm. um, and then on, on the points around um, the, the sort of the government industry collaboration, I, and Microsoft thinks, and sort of with this part of the reason why we brought together the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, is that the focus w should really be on defenses and not on supporting offensive operations, whether, and hack back to an extent, falls into that category, because you are attacking a different structure. And part of the reason why we think this is you actually destabil destabilizing the system, right? Mm -hmm. There's very few, um, few players, I would say, that know how to respond offensively in a way that it's targeted and has minimized effect. The, the fact that if, if you ex expanded that um, legally, um, the ability to do so to a broad, broad sway of players, would a you would actually severely destabilize the internet. Um, so, so that's kind of, I'm, I'm not sure that's a solution. No. <laughs> yeah. no, I think that was, that was pretty useful, uh, Kaya. Francois, if I'd like to go back to something you said about the Wassenaar um, Agreement. Um, and uh, the dual use of uh, the d dual use ideas in the Vasanar agreement, including cyber weapons or cyber means used for uh, certain kinds of uh, ends, if you like, uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit more on that? I'm very interested in that idea. So yes, in the Vasanar agreement, you have this uh, the accord. Between the agreement between the state was created to have this limitation and dual use object. So is this idea that an object which is at the same time, which is at first, let's say, mm -hmm. a civilian object, object that you will use for various purposes but offensive activity, may also be turned into something used for offensive activities mm -hmm. or for mass surveillance or, for example, acting against either your population or another state. Um, so since a few years now they are discussing so how it works. It's a very technical and we come back with this idea why I bring back, I bring the vast agreement in this discussion also because what we see is when you want to regulate software or you want to regulate this dual use object, mm -hmm. you need to get very technical because how it works is you have a list of objects mm -hmm. and then now they are doing lists in which they are listing specific 
cyber objects, let's say, cyber tools, that may be used in a dual use uh, mm -hmm. dimension. And the main one, the one on which they agreed first, was this intrusion software. So those software that will allow you to access into a system with the idea that you can use it for a lot of purposes, and it can be very useful. For example, it can be useful for a research perspective, it can be useful for a company like Microsoft to develop softwares, and like you need to have those tools. It's not because the software has these possibilities that it cannot have other possibilities, other objectives. Um, the problem is you can sell the software and then they can be used to access the system, either of your population, of people in another country, or governmental computers. So the idea with this regulation within uh, the vast argument was to say, if a software has this specific particularity, you cannot proliferate, proliferate it to specific countries, countries that will use it against their population, for example. Again, it's a non-binding instrument. But I think it's a very interesting starting point, maybe, to use this kind of list, the way they worked, to see how we could link the public core hardware, let's say, what was in the norm, actually, on what you mentioned at the beginning, to a more like software dimension. Okay. It's maybe not the best for the human dimension, but for at least the software. Oh no, I agree. <laughs> and I think the uh, human dimension, I just say that, uh, you know, it, say the example given by the, uh, the police officer uh, downstairs in the last uh, panel, you know, just before lunch, uh, there was a young a woman police officer, for those who were not at that session, uh, who spoke about the human aspect of what happens when there is a, a, a content which is used in a very malicious and harmful way and circulated. So I think that's the kind of human aspect that we have to consider when we say uh, how the internet is being used. It may not be directly linked to the public core, but can the public core respond to that? And with the advances in artificial intelligence and the algorithms that are being written, you know, is there some possibility of preventing the worst kind of human abuses and which can be pretty devastating in, um, in countries like, uh, like India, given their diversity uh, in so many areas? Uh, is there some way that the core itself can be uh, can be utilized in a way to uh, to affect this because I think the, there's a very tricky question involved when you get into software always you know because there is the question of it being open free fair the question of privacy the question of encryption but at the same time there are these very real abuses of this medium malicious uses of this medium that have terrible human consequences, terrible human uh, costs. So uh, I'm not sure that that's not got to be a separate kind of a norm. I'm not sure you can bring it into the public core, but I think it's something we have to look at, human cost of how the internet is being, uh, being used. But um, uh, Zine, is there anything you'd like to add? By the way, I wanted to mention that I really enjoyed going through your uh, paper, which was distributed at the India EU uh, you know, consultations yesterday. Uh, she has analyzed all the 11 norms and given the legal implications, what is what it's already supported by in international uh, law and by existing rules and regulations. And uh, I think that is the whole idea, you know, that I think you have to go back to what Joe Nye calls the regime complex because what he argues is it's not that there's no internet governance or there is no uh, no system governing the internet and we have to invent it from scratch. What he's suggest suggesting is there's a huge and complex network of organizations, technical and otherwise, there things like the UN Charter which come in because there are things that all states have subscribed to in the UN Charter. There are other international agreements and all of them in some way impinge on what we can and cannot do in cyberspace. And, uh, but the thing is that they, it's difficult to find a set of norms that codifies everything that's already agreed to and says this will apply right across cyberspace to all states and to non-state uh, actors. So I, I would like to uh, now, you know, if any of you want to ask questions, and Zine, if you'd like to make some comments. Mm. 
Um, I just would like to add something to the um, issue of influencing through information which was raised and then the implications this can have in real life, so the human costs mm -hmm. and the riot it can steer. Um, and I think you raised really also the important counter argument, of course, like now going, because it, it, and in the end it would mean, um, yeah, regulating content, right? Like going into what is, what is said or what is written. And of course that raises huge questions of um, the right to privacy and um, I mean encryption also is used in a positive way when we look at um, human rights defenders using encryption in order to not be caught by um, governments. Yeah, that's all I wanted to add to that. Point. Okay. Um, would any of you like to ask each other anything on your presentations? Mm -hmm. I, I think I would like to make another point because I think it's not, you sort of mentioned it uh, quickly. Could you talk into the mic? Yeah, sorry, you sort of mentioned it quickly, uh, which was sort of the, the other aspect of the mass market products, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the, um, the, the norm that Microsoft called for yeah. uh, three years ago, where the, 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 which is more, is less about content, at least at that point where we put it forward, it was. It was more about if you, it, you when you look at mass market products, that are used by the vast majority of, of the populations. I think probably Windows is the case in point. Um, you know, where, where it's in so many systems used by individuals, the governments across the world. So the, the, the call was to not interfere with those products because you, exp you, know, you, you cannot really target just one particular individual or one particular group, by, which is also not great, but like you actually um, open up to an, attack, to an attack whole swathes of population because all of them use it. So I think that's the other aspect we haven't sort of touched upon yet here, but would also sort of just put it out there for food, as food for thought. Thank you. Uh, to add anything at this point, if not, let me open it up for questions to the floor. We have about 20 minutes, and then I'll give everyone a minute each for their closing. So questions, comments, suggestions, we're open to all of them. Yes? Is there a mic? Yeah. OK. OK, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Diya Basu. I'm a doctoral researcher from the American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I had a question about really this valorizing of the multi-stakeholder model, especially with re regard to the core internet kind of resources. And just questioning, are there certain functions that are better served uh, in a more centralized, top-down kind of model, and I'm thinking particularly about uh, standard settings as one of them, where it's, you know, it's very technical. There isn't, even though everyone is allowed to participate, in uh, de facto, it's really a very kind of uh, one community, one stakeholder that makes decisions. So could we look at core internet kind of resources and the core kind of uh, uh, subjects that we're looking at in this discussion, not necessarily always from a multi-stakeholder model, and that maybe we've overvalorized that model so mu too much. Um, uh, w would any of you like to respond to that? Any points? Otherwise, I'll take that if... Uh I just wanted to say that I think the intent of the uh, the uh, norm that was proposed in the GCCS, uh, GCSC, um, at any rate on the public core of the internet, was not to take away from the technical community, but to say that states should then, you know, agree, states and non-state actors should agree not to attack let's say, the technical organizations and bring down their infrastructure, technical infrastructure, uh, precisely because without technology, this medium can't function. Uh, we are not saying that the states should set the standards. Obviously, the technical uh, institutions have to do that. 
and states would then all have to agree within the technical community belonging to each of those states uh, how the issue should be dealt with. Uh, the issue is that are you allowed to attack it? No. You know, that the answer is no. That we all agree that no, none of us should knowingly, intentionally, substantially harm this public core. But the idea is not to take over the running of the public core. There's a difference. You know, the, the technical organizations are obviously the most competent to do that. The same way that finally, for any implementation mechanism to pass into law to implement a norm, uh, states have to pass the legislation first internationally and then take it back to their national legislative bodies or pass executive orders, whatever is, uh, is required. Uh, so I think there would be a sphere of influence within which each stakeholder uh, operates, but I think it is important to have a multi-stakeholder model because otherwise very often, uh, you know, we who as lay persons who don't have technical knowledge, people in the government, policy makers, you may know a lot about the mechanics of how to bring up, how to introduce a bill in parliament or how to introduce a resolution in the UN. But unless the tech, you take the technical community on board and there's a joint discussion about what is technically possible, I know what's diplomatically possible or politically possible, but I don't know what's technically possible. I would have to go to a technical expert for that. So that's the value of the multi-stakeholder model. And if you don't involve civil society, you don't know how the average user is going to feel about things, you know. You may agree as a state, the industry may agree as private sector, the technical organization may say it can be done, but unless you put it up and ask for comments from everybody, how would you know? So academia has a lot of knowledge that's not necessarily in industry because unless it's, unless it's commercially viable, you know, translational technology is not really the norm, it's the exception. Uh, so um, I think for all these reasons, I would strongly support the multi-stakeholder uh, model, uh, but I agree with you, within their spheres of influence, you know, we, can, we can't carry the multi-stakeholder model to uh, uh, the extreme where we say, everybody has to be consulted on everything, I agree. But in this particular context, I think we do have to look at multi-stakeholder discussions. Actually, my question was more about who has access to these forums. You know, we say multi-stakeholder, mm -hmm. but who are the people who are really making the change? Uh, which, uh, could you speak into the mic? Because I don't think the others can, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm a big proponent of the multi-stakeholder uh, yeah. model, please don't get me wrong. Yeah, but my, yeah. I'm just trying to question that model mm. in terms of access to the platforms that, or the forums that say they are so-called multi-stakeholder. So that, I'm, I'm questioning that. I'm a proponent of the multi-stakeholder model. But I'm saying when we yeah. say civil society, and you go to an, uh, say for example, I'll just give a, a concrete example. You go to a, an ICANN public meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, who are the people there who are really, one, have the ability to attend a public meeting, mm -hmm. two, can follow the language in a public meeting, three, uh, who have the technical wherewithal to kind of discuss some of the very technical issues that happen in an ICANN meeting or in a uh, RFC that's called for by ITF. I mean, so I'm, I'm also kind of trying to understand and question the, uh, the, the issues about access, about language, about technical know-how, about bigger and more powerful countries uh, having greater say in the way some of these uh, uh, some of these decisions are made, so I'm I'm trying to question something that I personally believe in yeah. as well. Yeah, I think that's why we say capacity building is so important, and capacity building is to include technical know-how as well, at least to a limited extent, to the extent that somebody who's dealing with policy issues. That's why governments are now insisting that. There has to be a total awareness of the benefits of technology and also uh, understand enough that you can go out and negotiate on these issues without making statements that are technically impossible, you know, that sort of thing. But I think in many countries, 
you're right, the capacity building is a real requirement on uh, negotiations in this area. And uh, that's why you need essentially policy experts as well as technical experts. And there first has to be a multi-stakeholder uh, process within the country before you get into talking internationally. And uh, in a sense, I, I did try to do that for a while when I was in the government by starting a joint working group on uh, private-public partnership between the government and the industry. And uh, we did work with academia as well and with civil society organizations. But uh, uh, I think most of us have still have a long way to go to understand that one organization can't do everything. And uh, that on certain aspects, you can be self-sufficient. On certain aspects, you have to cooperate and have a discussion, have a dialogue. Would anyone yeah. like to add to that, Zine? Um I, I find the point really valuable. And I think um, these underlying power dynamics, also in capacity building, actually, are super interesting to look at. Um, I mean, it's a pragmatic approach to a certain extent, because if the private sector owns um, a big part of the infrastructure, then of course it's like good to know and also often the technical expertise is missing, maybe at governmental level. So it's good to consolidate and see what is feasible, what is, might also be um, wanted in terms of then also chip in for doing things. Um, but yeah, I find that's a really good point and also with capacity building because it's not purely telling maybe less ICT developed countries to how technology works um, and technology never is, um, let's say, valuably neutral. So it always, of course, you, it's designed in a certain way. It's designed by humans. So there is already something in, but then also, for example, capacity building also frames risks, right? What are the risks out there? And there comes, of course, then a perspective and maybe an export of certain ideas into the play as well that might be then exported from those countries into other countries. So I think it's necessary to acknowledge that it's not purely about technology and technical solutions, but about a lot of more um, things we need to take into account when talking about it. A comment or a suggestion, please go to the mic. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My name is Ilona Stadnik. I'm a visiting researcher at Georgia Tech Internet Governance Project. So I've been quite a long time researching this cyber norms uh, issue and I really appreciate what the commission is doing, what the private sector is doing regarding the norm making. But the real question is that since uh, the reality is that the states are still decisive in norm making and norm uh, enforcement, what is your strategies to enforce states, to force them to implement what you have uh, been elaborated so far? So what are like the real steps, how to involve them to, not to simply to listen to you, but implement what you have uh, done so far, so thank you. Uh, yes, I can do that. <laughs> um, but I, I think, and I will invite others. I think so from a Microsoft perspective, I think, uh, I, I don't know whether you've seen sort of over the past week, I feel or so, we we one of the one of the things that we've we've issued was a basically a petition is a call for digital peace uh, where we, we try and get uh, the the general populace involved to to basically broaden the understanding from a small number of um, experts that sort of know and deal with the issue to a general population to to, to drive awareness of the risk and the problems in cyberspace, and then to put pressure on governments to act and implement them domestically. Um, I, I, I think that's the exact right point. I think uh, we, um, you know, we, we are far from having impl the implementation in place. We are seeing, I think, a lot of movement in that direction. I think there's uh, not just the discussion of the new UNGGE, but there's a small number of different initiatives by um, sort of countries like Switzerland, countries like Mexico, Singapore, that see that this is a highly, highly um, a, a unstable environment and, and want to push particularly the implementation of the 11 norms because that is something that has been agreed and it's good if we move forward on it. But we also would really, have been encouraged over the past 
like year or so, and you know, yesterday, I, today, at some point, uh, over the night, uh, where countries are starting to call out actors uh, when they um, when they sort of, when they when they uh, break the norms, right, and and start making more of a clear um, clear call on like, so this is wrong, you shouldn't do it, because. The, uh, it, you know, before two years ago, not even that happened, right? It, I think the, the, the Sony attack was the first one that was actually called out as a, oh, it's a breach, so maybe you shouldn't do this. Uh, but, uh, you know, like in increasing that type of behavior, increasing um, even just the calling out and linking it to the norms, right? Saying that um, wanna cry was a breach of international norms, and I feel no one said that. I think there was a lot of articles about it, there was lots of written about it, but no one actually linked it to the international law or international agreements, I think would be an important first step. I think that's very interesting, and I, I just like to say that, you know, I don't think anyone can force states, but what we can do is to persuade states that it would be in their best interest. And uh, I think efforts are going on uh, with individual states, with groups of states, regionally, uh, and uh, after all, the UNGG in norms, which were not binding, non-voluntary, ASEAN, which has given a formal underwriting of those 11 norms, which I think is very, very significant. Several individual countries have come out in support and said they would be prepared to, buy, uh, to make them into binding uh, norms. Not all countries, obviously there are those who don't agree. But uh, I, I personally think that, uh, you know, from when I was involved in this area, when I started getting involved in this area seven years ago, there's been a huge amount of progress in the dialogue, in the understanding and the amount of awareness that there is that it's important to have some kind of regulation, some kind of norms, if we really want to preserve uh, cyberspace. So I think it'll have to be a combination of initiatives. I don't think there's one solution fits all, and maybe you have to have different approaches with different countries, different groups of countries, and hopefully eventually we'll come to a stage where everybody sees, or there's at least large consensus, broad consensus, if not universal consensus, to, to come to some kind of agreement to make what is essentially a wonderful medium a little safer for all of us. John? Oh, it's John. Oh, sorry. If, Francois, please. Yes. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add two points on that. The, I think the first question or the first issue is we have a huge diversity of norms and they are all very different. So on the point you are making, some norms are actually related to international law and the implementation will not be like really implementing them, but just they contribute to the interpretation of the existing international law. And I think on that one of the points we could go further is, for example, due diligence, where for now we have a norm that is just to say states should not allow their territory to be used. But there are plenty of questions that we will not address from an international point of view, but we can address through a norm point of view with an implementation after. Is there is the same statute for the launching state, the state from the territory of which the attack is launched, and the state of which just the network is used for the transit of the attack. So I think it's one of the very interesting way norms may be implemented in the future, because they will be called, they will be used by states when addressing this kind of circumstances, this kind of situation. Um, the other point I wanted to make on the implementation, I think the OSC make a great job in this uh, way. They have the only, I would say, package of norms that has been adopted, because the UN one is still even a draft, but it never reached the resolution um, stage. Uh, while the OSC norms, the 2013 and the 2016, has been adopted by the member state, and there is a real implementation within the OSC member state in two ways. Inside the countries, they have to put the point of contact, they have to implement the regulations and things like that um, to create this kind of, yes, confidence in cyberspace. There is also those regular sub-regional training organized by the OSC in the member states to like train the people who have to deal with this question in this country uh, to understand how the norm works, what they bring, and what are the advantage to implement them in their daily work. So, it's not an implementation since there is no uh, transcription in the domestic law and domestic regulation, but just they became part of the daily habits of the people dealing with these questions, so I think. 
Uh, just to quickly answer your question, um, I think enforcement of norms could have a lot to do with who's forwarding the norms as well. So I heard this the other day at work that the best way to get someone to do something you want them to do is to tell them that it was their idea in the first place. <laughs> um, so I think what we should also, I mean, start exploring is how do we get more actors to essentially not merely endorse the norms, but maybe even um, uh, forward a different version of the same norm, if you will. Um, I think that probably there's a better chance of policing the internet that way if you make everyone um, equal stakeholders. And maybe that's not necessarily the case in the status quo, but I think that movement could uh, make a lot of difference. Thank you. Um, hi, <coughs> John Mallory from MIT. So I just wanted to um, enrich the analytical framework slightly on this. And uh, so one thing I would mention is that, uh, you know, we have three modes of responding. Uh, first of all, I accept the goal we're trying to protect the internet and make sure that cyberspace works, produce confidence, and so forth. So we have three modes of responding to this. We can have state restraint, so I think that's what we here see in the public core. We can have security and resilience as another mode to Im improve that dimension, and then we can have deterrence. So in the deterrence category, there's what are the consequences you might want to impose for those actors who might uh, break, uh, break these systems. Then if we go to the other direction, uh, another dimension on this, <coughs> we identify some set of components that are this core, uh, but we have the issue of, and it was mentioned, of um, not just refraining from taking the action, but also due diligence on the part of states uh, in which uh, you know, these, uh, this hardware might be located, also the operators who are operating it, which includes security architectures and so forth, so best practices on all that. Then we have the supply chains coming into it, um, which um, are not exactly maybe as solid as they ought to be, although we understand that Huawei now has a separation kernel in their routers, and I don't think some of the other ones do. Uh, so that's kind of your dimensionality, and then it's also kind of static right now. You want a more dynamic one that will improve the level of information assurance in these systems so that they are harder to attack. So going forward, you raise that. So that's an incentivizing the various operators and, and, and other actors. And then finally, I think, um, and this is an international law question, you know, we can't even get this stuff right in peacetime. But what happens in wartime? And then, and in wartime, if it's not you know, the world at war, it's a couple of belligerents within the system, what are their responsibilities in terms of collateral impacts on the shared infrastructure? And what are the consequences uh, for them, uh, you know, if they if they break things, um, so I think that's more of, of the richer range, and I understand it's not simplifying the problem. You've just made things more difficult for us, John. <laughs> <laughs> but no, appreciated, appreciated, uh, and I think all the points you made are very interesting. I like the one about the three modes of addressing the issues. The state restraint, the resilience and deterrence. But how we actually frame the norms for these is the question, really. And once having framed the norms, how we implement them. Um, and um, I had promised to end by three, but since we started five minutes late, I'm going to take five minutes longer, which will give you 25 minutes to network and do whatever you want before we have to reconvene downstairs for the uh, plenary again, I think at 3.30. Um, so uh, uh, is, is, would you like to ask something? Yes, sure. please go ahead. Could you just introduce yourself, please? Hi there, I'm um, Stuart Brown from the UK Foreign Office. Yeah. Um, just coming in on something Kaya said just now, um, so as many people in the room will be aware that overnight there was um, a um, exposure by the UK government and a number of governments around the world about uh, militia and Russian cyber activity. Mm -hmm. um, on the question specifically, um, you raised about how we link this to international normative behavior. I just uh, want to... Slowly, please, sorry, so we can't follow. Uh, yeah. Linking it to... Um, international law. I just want to read uh, an extract from our Foreign Secretary's statement on this. Mm -hmm. um, this pattern of behavior demonstrates their desire to operate without regard to international law or established norms and to do so with a feeling of impunity and without consequences. Mm -hmm. So I think that's responding to some of the things you said um, before. And um, one of the things I was we were talking about yesterday in the EU India forum um, was what, what does the whole framework look like? And the, the point I made there was 
First, you agree the norms or the rules, what the rules look like. The second thing is you apply the rules. And capacity building is a really important part of that. So I was really happy to hear the panel talking about that. Um, there's capacity building and then also CBMs, the frameworks to actually implement it. And I fully agree that the OSCE is the best framework we've got there. Um, but just to take one of those norms as an example, the OSCE um, CBM around having 24-7 points of contact. How can you have a 24-7 point of contact if you haven't even got a computer emergency response team? So these things are fundamentally linked. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final point, though, is you need to have a system of calling out the rule breakers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what happened overnight is an example of that. Um, I'm aware of six other countries who have come out with supporting statements so far, and I believe there should be more coming out through the day. So please do watch that. Um, I think it's quite interesting. But I think, as the point was said, two years ago, we weren't here at all. Um, so this debate is really evolving and really changing. Um, that's a statement, here's a question. Um, uh, on the one hand, we need to discuss, and that's what we're doing, we're talking about what the rules are. But then there's also the need to take action. So where is the balance between discussion and action? And um, specifically with the private sector, um, uh, what is stopping us actually just going out and doing things to make the internet safer, um, to sort of implement codes of conduct for how the Internet of Things um, evolves. And I know that we've got this with the Tech Accord and the Charter of Trust. Um, but yeah, question about what is the balance between discussion and action? Thank you. Thank you. More questions, so let's take that and then, oh, two more questions. Can I take these three and then we, we could all respond to them jointly? Yeah, I have a a comment and slash a suggestion, and I would invite discussion on it. Um, of creating, a, so I am Shashank, and I work for Mishi Chaudhary and Associates. We're a tech law firm based out of Delhi. Um, I would like to say that creating a backdoor or a hackback in software is bad for the entire ecosystem, and we need to realize that. Having said that, um, making use of open source software, um, especially by governments, could be a possible solution at transparency and at the same time maintaining um, um, the security. So that's something which um, we deeply believe, and I would also like to invite any discussion on this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm Peter from Access Now. I was wondering if we could dig a little bit into um, kind of the flip side, which you mentioned of um, the dual use technologies and the attempts to uh, limit the spread and, and proliferation of um, hacking and, and other invasive uh, malware delivery devices and, um, and the exploits that they depend on. Um, from my perspective, that, that hasn't been a very successful effort um, despite attempts to put human rights considerations at the forefront of uh, export controls decisions. And many of the same governments um, still, again, from our perspective, house companies that are exporting this technology to, to governments specifically that would do harm with them, including the UK, Germany, Italy, and others. And, um, and, and so, yeah, I'm wondering, while we're trying to uh, protect mass market software, um, and what can we learn from the uh, attempts to, uh, to limit even that really uh, small core of, of, of software only sold to governments, supposedly, um, but that is really meant to do harm and is doing harm? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll, I'll go down the, the uh, line and start with you, Zine. Okay, I'll just quickly take up the first question from Stuart um, about norms and we first agree on norms and then we implement them and where does practice come in um, or action. And I think it needs to be definitely complementary because also the norms we are agreeing on are pretty broad and general in a lot of terms. So there's a lot of need for clarification. And I think therefore it's really important what you just read to actually when something happens that is deemed to be inappropriate to also speak out. And I think it's coming more and more, but that needs to be, um, that, that is definitely one way to first implement maybe these norms in a f certain way, but also what if we don't find a fora now to, to discuss norms further, right? Or to or international law, what do we do then? And of course, unilateral action is something that I think especially power, not that, in military capabilities, especially powerful states, wouldn't want to. But in general, it's necessary that um, it's not just paperwork, but also action is coming out of that. Thank you. 
Kaya? Yeah. Um, so, so yes, I, I think what I was trying to say is like, the thing that the UK is doing is the right thing, so yay. Um, but um, on your question about the industry, um, um, I, you, I think the industry is doing a lot, right? I think the challenge, and I think the challenge is when you say the industry is such a broad term of companies that are massive and companies that are super small, and companies that do software, companies that do IoT. So it's so it's always so it's difficult. So I think I, you know I would say this, but I think initiatives like the Tech Accord and the Charter of Trust are actually super important because they try and bring. Um, different industry players together to try and address the issues and try to raise the lowest kind of common denominator. You know, because I think the, the, a lot of the bigger players um, have systems in place, they're not perfect by any means, but they, they actually have substantially increased the security of the software and investment in security of the software over the past, I guess, decade. The, the question is how do you take some of those learnings and ensure that all market players, including new ed entrants, actually have some, some, th some of those best practices. And some of those best practices actually have been the same for the past 10 years and you, you know, things like patch, please patch. You know? um, and so some of it is, is, is just is proving hard to, to do. Um, on the open source uh, question, as the largest contributor of open source software in the world, which is Microsoft, um, um, I think you know. I think uh, yes and no, right? I think you need to look at. Um, you, it's not necessarily inherently more secure just because more people look at it. Uh, it can also mean that more people see vulnerabilities and don't report it. Right, so it's, it, I, th I would think it more about, think about what is the most appropriate use that, you, uh, most appropriate tool that you wanna use to address your problem rather than sort of have it limited by where it's open source or, or propriety software. Um, and I will leave you the Wassenaar question. <laughs> I'm just going to say, Francois, uh, Francois, that we all look forward to your views on the dual use technology spread. <laughs> So, uh, it's a tricky question and I'm not sure how to address it, but yes, it's always a problem is we can take norms and say not sure they will be implemented. What is also very important on this side is to understand that they may be violated and there is mass violation of human rights by the proliferation of those objects, but the other side, some norms may be also used for justifying mass violation of human rights or other conducts like that. So it's where we have to be careful and maybe not push too much on too many, um, too many norms. What I wanted to bring here is again the due diligence one. Because the due diligence, some states, some people also, some uh, academics let's say, push the idea that states have to take preventive measures, which is not in the law, but in terms of cyber, you should adopt preventive measure to control in some way your system. This offer a very good solution for a country willing to justify a mass surveillance project. Because then you can say, because I have the duty to know what is happening in my system, I can implement and buy all these technology that are available through uh, this kind of, uh, of market. Um, it has also a downside effect because then also big state or big players may be incentivized to oblige those small countries not having this technology to buy their own technology to protect their system. So it's where we have to be careful in the balance, in the right balance, in the, the norms. And VASNA is going in the right direction, but it will never be enough, I would say, on, uh, on this point. I just wanted to jump on a question we had before, which was what is happening in wartime? So this wartime, peacetime distinction. I think what is important to see is we have already a lot of norms of international law, rules of international law that address this question of both peacetime and wartime. What the norm we have, the non-binding norms we are talking now are doing is when we are in peacetime, we have the possibility to go in more granularity, to having more like agreements on what should be protected and how it should be protected. Still, if tomorrow there is a war between two states, there are a lot of regulation in international law that will make unlawful having done specific aggression against cyber, against the core of the internet, against civilians. Also, one of the main parts of international law is it's not a domestic system. You don't have a court, you have the International Court of Justice, which is a voluntary jurisdiction, so nobody will bring a, a malware attack to the International Court of Justice. Still, states are respecting international law because they expect the other side 
to behave the same way, mainly in an armed conflict. So in wartime, I would not expect a state unless a very, very specific situation doing mass atrocities through cyber means, as they would not do uh, with regular means. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, does IHL apply in wartime? The UNGG says so. The last UNGG failed on this question because three countries came back on this question, yet they made previous statements where they recognize this applicability. Um, and there is also what I would say on this question, and we had a, a, a talk this morning about international law, is it's a non-question to ask whether international applies to cyberspace because there is, the question should be, is there is reason, reason for international to not applying to cyberspace? Cyberspace is not a new domain you are taking activity on the land, in the air, on the seas, or in the outer space, using a new mean, using a new tool, but you are not in a new world, so you are not changing the rules. And the rules that apply to a ship apply also to the cyber activity you are conducting from the ship. I don't know if it's, you understand what I mean by that. So, in wartime, a ship is bound by international law and mainly by IHL. It has to respect the civilians. It has to engage using a specific code of conduct, using a specific rules. It's the same way if it engaged through cyber means. So it's why I say it's a non-question. And I understand the debate, but the debate is mainly a political one. It's not a legal one. Thank you, Francois. I'm afraid you guys will have to take this offline because I'm getting signals that it's time out. But Madhulika, you have the last word. Yeah, I'll just make this quick. Uh, going back to um, Stuart's question about how do you balance um, just mere lip service and making sure that there's some action happening. Um, as you mentioned, naming and shaming is definitely one way to go. Um, having like-minded states come together and shun the outlier state, for instance, is one way to go. Um, but also going back to what I had mentioned previously is that it's important that norms emanate, not, uh, emanate also from emerging economies, that there's a buy-in that you have. Um, and this might be this have to this has to be posed a proposition in a way, um, just to make sure that we um, make the tent bigger than it is right now. Um, and then going back to my previous comments as well, how do you make sure there's some public and private cooperation? Um, so to that extent, the, the kind of work that you see Microsoft doing with the private sector, you ideally want, let's say, a state doing that as well. Um, banding people up together and bringing people into a consensus. Um, so I think, yeah, that's slowly where we should be moving towards. How do you find consensus between states and how do you involve um, other states as well? Thank you, Madhulika. And please join me in giving our wonderful panel a round of applause. Thank you all very much.